I've spent the past few years uh, running around the country giving lectures at law schools and college campuses about marriage policy and the Constitution. But at the end of the day, policy and law are tools. They are tools that serve people, ideally for the betterment of those people. Uh, and good marriage policy can help promote good marriages. So tonight I get a chance to speak a little bit not about marriage policy or law or the Constitution or those kind of abstract ideas that are one step removed from real people, but I get the chance to speak a little bit about concrete human beings, college students, in a concrete environment, college campuses. Because what are, are of primary importance in this debate are going to be the actual people and the relationships that they can form. I've become somewhat infamous now for making an argument that the law teaches and that it has consequences. And my message tonight will be that ideas have consequences. How we think about marriage and human sexuality will impact how we act. And then in turn, how we act will then impact how we subsequently act. Our actions build up habits, either virtues or vices, and the culture in which we live, particularly the campus culture, with its distinctive rituals and its expectations, will in turn impact how we think and how we act. And while no two college experiences are quite the same, the undergraduate years do have certain similarities. Students will be challenged intellectually, socially, and ethically. Most students will arrive at college knowing few, if any, of their classmates. And navigating the maze of social expectations and then the ensuing climbing of social ladders in a community of strangers many students are forced to ask themselves, possibly for the first time, what type of a person am I? What type of a person do I want to become? And with what type of a person do I want to become friends? And for many, this explicit self-examination and the social selection, choosing you know, which finite group of people to befriend out of an infinite array of possibilities, is a first-time experience in life. In grade school, and junior high, and in high school, such choices weren't as necessary. There were certain cliques that people just fell into. When you get to college, you get to reinvent yourself. You have to define yourself one way or another. And so no longer living under the parents' roof, no longer in a supportive school, a supportive neighborhood, a church community, Students no longer have the external supports encouraging them to strive to meet the demands of an upright life, and then holding them accountable when they might fail. Instead, they find themselves subjected to new forms of pressure, a campus culture that demands conformity as the price of social acceptance, a professoriate that preaches new ethical dogmas, and administrators whose policies recognize no values besides legality, liability, and physical health. So it's easy to see how otherwise virtuous students can begin to go astray, and how those already set on a bad path can have little hope for reform. And yet most students arrive at college relatively unaware of the patterns of life and the social expectations that await them. Many unsuspecting freshmen innocently join sports teams, they enter Greek life, and they otherwise expect to live normal, active social lives, but have little idea of what campus culture will bring. Once seduced into that campus culture, they, many will find it hard to break free. Even if they find themselves dissatisfied and unfulfilled, they assume the problem is with them, not with the campus culture. And for those who try to resist it from the get-go, they're frequently unclear about what the alternative is. Apart from some religious campuses and then some religious enclaves on secular campuses, the college years can be a bit of a wandering experience. Uh, sex is to be expected, but with no expectation of commitment, never mind marriage. Those desiring an alternative have very little to look to by way of example, uh, very few role models to emulate. Gone are the days of courtship gone are the days of dating as an explicit preparation for marriage. Gone are the days of using one's late adolescence and early adulthood to form habits, stable dispositions, virtues required for healthy relationships. 
Instead, exploitation tends to loom large, and we now see many marriages today fail. And it gets worse. Campus officials, both in the lecture halls and in administrative offices, rather than challenging a debased campus culture, actually aid and abet it. Abstinence education. That's a scientifically disproven method of avoiding pregnancy and disease. A pill and a latex sheath is all you need. Chastity, hardly a virtue. The best moral philosophy and clinical psychology tell us it's a vice, an unhealthy attitude of repressing sexual desire, hating, one, hating one's body and viewing sex as dirty. A progression of courtship, dating, marriage, and then sex. No, all you need are consenting adults in any number or pairing to have good sex. And marriage is an outdated ideal anyway. Most students won't buy that last argument. They still long for a marital relationship of some sort at some point. But they don't know how to get there or what to do now. They lack access to the cultural scripts and virtues that lead to healthy, flourishing marriages. The messages they'll hear on many college campuses, why not pornography and masturbation as an alternative to sexual assault? Why not premarital sex and cohabitation as a means of better getting to know one another, to see if you can live together before the wedding vows, to see if you're sexually compatible? And even if not as preparation for marriage, why not hookups just as a sign of temporary affection and, well, because of the fun of it. They're enjoyable, they're pleasurable. And yet it's not just the hookup culture. On college campuses today, if you think men and women are equal in dignity, yet distinct and complementary, bringing unique gifts to bear on all aspects of life, you can expect to be called a sexist. If you think mothering and fathering are distinct, that there's no such thing as parenting in the abstract, you can expect to be met with hostility. If you think people with same-sex attractions shouldn't commit same-sex actions, you can expect to be called a hater and a homophobe. And if you're at an elite college and you intend to make motherhood a priority, expect to be told that you're wasting your education. From liberal dogmas on homosexuality to liberationist agendas on sex, feminism on marriage, from the social pressures put on guys and girls to be sexually active, to the resulting pornography, masturbation, alcohol, and body image problems, college campuses aren't a pretty sight. After my own four years as an undergraduate at Princeton, this problem was readily apparent to me and to many of my classmates. And a potential remedy seemed worth trying. Rather than cowering away from liberal orthodoxy on human sexuality, we thought to ourselves, why don't we subject it to intense, critical, rational scrutiny? Why don't we expose its intellectual weaknesses? And then why don't we build a network of support to oppose it, to counteract it, to build up something new and better? So February 2005 saw the launch of a new student group at Princeton, the Elizabeth Anscombe Society, named for the famed Cambridge University professor of philosophy, a star student of Ludwig Wittgenstein, the intellectual defender of traditional sexual ethics in the Western tradition. Elizabeth Anscombe was probably the most famous female philosopher of the 20th century. And so the Anscombe Society named itself after her to, to show the intellectual respectability and the kind of rigor that they expected to carry out. This was their opening mission statement. Quote, we aim to foster an atmosphere where sex is dignified, respectful, and beautiful, where human relationships are affirming and supportive, where motherhood is not put at odds with feminism, and where no one is objectified, instrumentalized, or demeaned. We aim to increase the level of respect among mem members of the university community who disagree on these issues, even as we explore our common understandings as well of our differences. Lastly, we hope to provide those students who strive to understand, live, and love their commitment to chastity and sexual ethics with the support they need to make their time at Princeton the best it can be. The students who formed the Anscombe Society were tired of being subjected to a dehumanizing campus culture 
and hoped to point to an alternative, a more excellent way. They were tired of the one-sided presentation of academic arguments related to marriage and the family. That biased syllabi inside the classroom, monolithic student groups outside of the classroom. So they hoped to balance the intellectual conversation. They were also tired of an administration that absurdly claimed to be morally neutral when it came to matters of sexuality, while the administrators consistently promoted liberal and liberationist sexual policies. They were determined to hold the administrators accountable and to seek change. And to do this, the Anscombe Society followed a three-pronged approach. First and foremost, as a group at an academic institution and as the heirs of Elizabeth Anscombe's legacy, they were about ideas, the give and the take of reason, the making and the countering of arguments. Too often, the academy has an orthodoxy of its own on issues relating to sexuality, and those orthodoxies are treated as if they're immune from challenge. The Anscombe Society, through guest lecturers, through newspaper op-eds, through discussion groups, they sought to provide serious and respectful counter-arguments. The scholars they brought to campus to give public lectures made the intellectual case for the traditional conception of human sexuality in the human family. From a multi- and interdisciplinary perspective, drew on works of philosophy, theology, ethics, biology, medicine, psychiatry, psychology, economics, and sociology. They then created an academic database on their website of all of the relevant articles in a format that was accessible to undergraduates. Second, but equally important, given the social realities on college campuses, the Anscombe Society set out to form a supportive community. If you're one of the few students who is personally committed to living a chaste life, you can often feel quite alone on your average secular college campus. Don't get me wrong, it's not as if everyone's having sex all the time at Princeton. But it changes the way you approach considering even the possibility of dating at college if you think all of your potential suitors will eventually get to the point where they ask for sexual favors. And as a result, many Chase students can just withdraw. They can put that aspect of their life on hold for four years. But part of this is that many of the students at Princeton didn't even know that many of the other ones existed. They thought they were all alone because they didn't realize that there were actually quite a few on campus who shared that commitment, but they were each keeping quiet. So the Anscombe Society wanted to bring this closeted community out into the open to get people to meet, to know each other, to provide alternative social activities for those students who weren't quite up to the usual scene of drunken debauchery. The third task was to provide assistance to students who needed help in meeting these ethical goals that they had set for themselves. Uh, this proved to be too ambitious, too demanding, um, requiring too much expertise for a mere student group. Um, addictions to pornography, body image problems, same-sex attractions usually will require professional assistance. And so it's not surprising that a place like Princeton has an LGBT center and a woman's center and various other uh, special centers with full-time staff uh, meant to equip people and to meet their needs. Nothing like that exists at a place like Princeton for those on the other side of the moral divide. So the students at Princeton have been working with the administration to try to establish a center like that at Princeton with the same university recognition and funding. Predictably, when a group like this starts at an Ivy League university, it makes waves. At first, it was treated as a novelty. Then some people were threatened by the existence of the group. Others were shocked that Princeton would allow a group that held, quote, homophobic or anti-woman views. But within the first couple of months, the mainstream media started paying attention. Reports ran in the New York Times, on Jay Leno's Tonight Show, and in various uh, other publications. The most unusual thing reporters noted about the group was that it wasn't religious, that the students thought that reason was on their side. Along with the media attention came interest from students at other college campuses, and the students at the Anscombe Society were ready to assist them. Over time, it became clear that this couldn't be done in an informal way, um, and so some alumni and some parents got together and they started a nonprofit organization called the Love and Fidelity Network. And then the Love and Fidelity Network got together to help organize chapters of the Anscombe Society's chapters of the Love and Fidelity Network 
on different college campuses across the United States. Five years ago, Love and Fidelity held its first annual national conference. Over 100 students from 20 different schools that year came from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, Columbia, Cornell, all of the Ivy League was represented. What they wanted to do was set the bar high. This was something that was gonna be done at the top level of the academy and at all other levels. They've now formed dozens of chapters across the United States and this year I think will be the sixth annual conference. So the future for groups like these is rather bright. In response to a relatively unpromising campus culture, coupled with the overreaching on the part of administrators and professors, students are beginning to organize, or they're beginning to respond systematically, and they're beginning to have a real impact. So even though I don't foresee campus culture changing in any radical way in the near term, I do think there's quite a bit of hope for your own children making it through the college years without being corrupted. What we'll more or less see is we'll see basically decent kids come to college with basically sound intuitions, basically uh, uh, incipient virtues, and then they'll be bombarded with an alternative corrupting message. And so the need is to equip these students with the arguments so that they can know that their basic gut instinct is correct. The need is to create alternative environments to counter the cultural pressures that can lead passion to override reason, the need is to form communities of virtue. Now, if you've been an attentive listener, you've noticed that most of my talk focused on a human good and a human virtue, the good of marriage and the virtue of chastity. This good and this virtue give shape to the vocations that many of your children will discern while in college, the vocation to marry governed by the virtue of chastity. But if you've been attentive, you've also noticed that there's a competing narrative, a narrative about autonomy and rights, where the only limits are consent and health, where consenting adults should do whatever they want to do, provided it causes no physical harm to a third party. At the end of the day, these are the two competing worldviews that are on offer on college campuses. One of them is in line with the truth about human beings and human flourishing, and one of them is not. You can get through college believing, and more importantly, acting in accord with truth and flourishing. You just need the resources to equip you. And so with more on that, we have the director of the Love and Fidelity Network, uh, Caitlin Seary, who offer a few words about what they're doing on college campuses and on what the real status uh, kind of on the ground is today. <laughs> 